This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is John Cameron in the middle, Richard Fields down on the other end. Gentlemen, something that actually talks to me in my own neighborhood, the gunshot sensors are a big issue here in Sacramento. They've actually added more. There was a scant, actually, protest about this shot spotter, the gunshot shot spotter being used in Sacramento, despite the fact that in Chicago, the Chicago Watchdog has found that they're ineffective at best, and at worst, they actually lead to discriminatory police practices. Um, do you guys have any thoughts? First of all, um, you know, being the hardcore Second Amendment uh, um, a proponent that I am, uh, I think uh, it doesn't matter if shots are fired. The only time you're concerned about shots being fired if you believe in, in uh, uh, the, the right to keep and bear arms is if somebody's shot. So, uh, you know, the idea that you know, somebody's target practice or uh, since the, the algorithms are so uh, poorly done, somebody fires off a loud uh, um, firework or uh, uh, any number of noises are misinterpreted as gunshots, and then uh, they, they go through a human being uh, to check it and, and, and judge it, and somehow this is this is way more uh, efficient than somebody calling 911. I think, as a citizen, I would much rather that uh, that another citizen called 911 to report a crime than relying on something that interprets noise as uh, a reason to scramble the the, uh, the heavily armed trigger happy police to a neighborhood, especially uh, when everything I've read says that the neighborhoods that get scrambled to most often are the ones that are uh, least trustful of the police. So I, I have a problem with it. I, I, even if the, the technology worked perfectly, um, you know, I, I, I don't really care if somebody's fine. I mean, it wakes me up, I'll go talk to my neighbor and say, quit doing target practice at one o'clock in the morning, please. Um, but you know, if, if a, a fellow citizen observes a crime or suspects a crime and calls him out, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I'm not okay with, uh, you know, some sensor uh, hanging from some kind of tree somewhere uh, directing the cops to my neighborhood. I don't know if it's been tested in court or if there's ever, even anybody has thought of testing it in court, but it seems to me like there would be a Fourth Amendment issue and not unlawful search and seizure. Uh, you know, just, just saying, I, you know, uh, the uh, fact of a gunshot is not, as you pointed out, a crime in and of itself. And uh, simply saying that because a gun has been fired, a shot has been heard, that that's uh, a reason to go uh, investigating uh, seems to be weak on search and seizure grounds. Well, and I, I didn't think about the Fourth Amendment, but uh, unreasonable search and seizure. But I think uh, if, if I were to check the myriad of Rules, regulations, and laws in Sacramento, where I live, I live in Sacramento, uh, California, that uh, firing off a gun in city limits other than an appropriate range or you know something under very very limited circumstances probably is a crime. But I'm saying a, it shouldn't be, and b, I agree with you, Richard, that, that it is a unlawful search and seizure. And c, who cares unless the crime's being committed. And you know, relying on algorithm-driven technology, we've we've all we've had many discussions on the shows about uh, you know whoever writes the algorithm sways uh, action and activity. You know, we've, we've talked numerous times about how major search engines don't allow you to get to where you want to go; they they send you to where they want you to go, and that's algorithm-based. And I wouldn't put past the people writing the algorithms for this uh, shot whatever it's called, program, shot starter, shot fire, shot, shot spotter, yeah, shot spotter, shot spotter, to uh, have uh, uh, monkey with those algorithms. So it's it's a mess, and I don't like it. It's just further encroachment uh, on, on on our freedoms, our, our freedom from being uh, watched by the overlords. And uh, I'd like to see uh, I'd like to see a nice Fourth Amendment uh, uh, claim against that. So well, I, I, it, I, it is an open microphone in the neighborhood. 
it's you know these things work as an open microphone and it has to be fairly sensitive so they can hear you talk you're walking down the street they can hear you talking just like your phone is on listening for your phone is you know you say it's it's listening for hey google or hey alexa or whatever thing it's actually sitting there listening to everything you say waiting to hear those words and the shot spotter works on the same technology it's the same thing mm -hmm. and we got open and i can attest to this neighborhood we have fireworks displays every night <laughs> And so there's no way this thing is picking up only gunshots. And I, we also have gunshots. We had, you know, one just down the street from my house just a, last week. But this shot spotter is clearly, it's not a solution. It's a solution looking for a problem, not an actual solution to a problem. They're just spending money on the law enforcement industrial complex. And I guess the, the contract's $30 million a year or for three years that's well i'd like i'd love to see the uh, the lobbyist uh, money that goes into uh, making uh, this uh, particular company and technology uh, uh, on the top shelf of police departments across the country yeah well police departments across the country are uh, have more pressure on more ways than one attorney general merrick garland is sicking the fbi on parents who are protesting on the uh, school board meetings because they get loud and angry at these school boards who are doing things they don't want to do. And I always thought Americans protesting at school board meetings was the most, most basic way to in interject with your democracy. But yet somehow you're now a domestic terrorist if you go in at the school board and shake your fist and yell. I, where have we gone? Right of assembly. I mean, this is First Amendment all over, right? The, the right of, of, of assembly, the right, well, peaceful assembly. And suppose, you know, presumably, uh, all we're hearing here are angry words, not uh, assault uh, on school board members, which would be obviously illegal and obviously uh, handled by, by the local gendarmes. Uh, so you've got freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. You have, the only thing I can say is, thank God, Merrick Gar Garland is not on the Supreme Court, what a menace he would be. Well, he's a pretty, he's pretty, he's a pretty good menace where he is, but he would be a greater menace. So, what the, in some of the articles I read on it, they they said that they're, uh, you know, that they're afraid and they want their members to be protected and they need the, the FBI to declare these people who who uh, are loud and boisterous and making threats to be domestic terrorists. Well, making threats. Uh, is is assault, and that's already against the law. So there's already laws to protect people from being assaulted, from, from being threatened. So you don't need to add another one because there's already a law there. And as Richard said, the local gendarmes will take care of it. So if uh, someone actually uh, uh, takes that assault and, and, and ramps it up to battery, there are laws on the books against battery. And, uh, you know, if somebody breaks into a meeting, uh, there are laws against breaking and entering. So there are, there are plenty of laws, way too many laws, already on the books that, that handle all of this. And if you're going to use that same, if you're going to paint people who are, are protesting at a meeting and using angry words as domestic terrorists, why was not every single BLM uh, meeting riot, whatever, painted with the same brush. Um, this is yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that, that uh, critical race theory is the uh, uh, thing that is actually being protested against. Yeah. Uh, we have well, and, a... And, and these, these, uh, these school board organizations uh, all say that critical race theory is not being taught, but the reports I'm getting from, from parents uh, around that I talk to around the country when I'm traveling, you know, to a tourist spot, uh, and people in Sacramento and coffee houses and all the rest of that uh, tell me that critical race theory is being taught, and and it is well within the rights of a parent to have input into what their children are being taught, especially when it's the kind of hokum that's critical race theory, because critical race theory basically is flat out racism. It says that 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 you are, are, are that your drives are based upon your race, your morals are based upon your race, uh, your activities are based upon your race, and that's if that's not a flat-out definition of racism, but I don't know what it is. Well, it is assigning guilt for everything that's wrong based on race, and, and you know, and that that's problematic to say the least. Yeah. Well, and let's not forget the 
Newsom just signed a bill into law that says you now have to have ethnic studies courses to graduate high school. It's oh, now they've now politicized education. And so when you talk, think about politicizing education and then the AG calling people who protest at the school board meetings domestic terrorists, these things start to make more sense. Yes, and they do. And then are, I think that, that the, the thing you were talking about, I didn't read about um, about that. I read that the, the high school students have to take a, uh, a morals class. They're required to uh, study morality. And I'm sure that morality is going to be, be deeply couched in uh, the, the, the horrors of capitalism, the wonders of socialism, and critical race theory. Uh, so I, I have a lot of concern about that as well. Well, I have concerns about government teaching morals. That is <laughs> an oxymoron if there ever was one. Yeah, we, we sit here and we talk about the, his, the, the horrors of the American government, and then we're going to have that same government teach our children morals. That what are we? This doesn't make any sense on any level, but yet that's what they're pushing, and you well, know, I think that that you know Americans have such absolute faith in the the the, the truthfulness of their their uh, of the political and and the executive and the judicial branch that I don't see why we're protesting. Oh wait, they don't. They don't have that. And, uh, and that um, that trust in those institutions as uh, I'm I'm actually I'm sorry I'm segueing for you James. Yeah, no, go for it, John. Knock yourself out. Okay. Um, you know we're um, everybody. Uh, not everybody. The polls by a wonderful polling organization, uh, the, the best polling organization, uh, based upon their level of success in the world. Uh, it was Gallup. The only thing they don't do anymore is uh, presidential polling. And I suspect I know the, the reason for that, but it sounds like uh, conspiracy theory, so I won't. Uh, they, were, they were wrong in an election where they were sure they were right, and they stopped, uh, they stopped doing presidential polling. They say that the level of trust in the media is the lowest it's been since uh, 2016. And we all know what was happening during 2016. It was a, a, a false conspiracy theory being touted by the media where other uh, actual crimes were covered up by the media. Um, but it's uh, the, the American public's confidence in, in Congress is at the, the lowest point it's been at, I think, ever. What's kind of scary to me is it's, it's confidence in the executive branch is slightly higher than its confidence in in, uh, in uh, uh, Congress, uh, I think that scares me a little bit. But the fact that, that that the American public is losing confidence and trustworthiness of uh, these bodies, the press, the Congress, the President, and 13-point drop uh, down to, I think, less than 50% of people actually believe in and have confidence in the judicial is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. Because uh, libertarians arrived there, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, don't trust any of them. Anybody, you know, we know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So uh, I think it's wonderful that that, uh, that the populace is waking up. Well, I, I think we can take it a little bit a step further. We are living in a uh, purported democracy, and the uh, executive branch, the judicial branch, and the uh, legislative branch all. Uh, in directly or indirectly get their power from the voters. And one of the other things that uh, Gallup measures is uh, the, the, uh, the amount of uh, trust in the voters that voters have, which is also at, a, at an all-time low. And why is that significant? Well, a democracy is simply rule by the majority, which puts minorities at risk, potentially. Uh, the old saying is that uh, a, democracy is, is a democracy is simply two wolves and a sheep voting on who's going to be lunch. And there's a lot of truth in that. And that's why we have not a pure democracy, but a Republican, a Republican democracy, a democracy where uh, there are safeguards built in, or supposedly safeguards built in, to make sure that the, the, that the, uh, the democracy, that the majority, doesn't impinge upon the, uh, the rights of minorities. That's what 
the, the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights to the Constitution is all about, is making sure the majority doesn't overstep its bounds and do things to minorities, and of course the smallest minority is a minority of one, uh, making sure that uh, us very small minorities are in fact protected from the ravages of majority votes. And those ravages are real. All you have to do is, is look at uh, some of the, uh, well, we're looking at weekends at, weekend at Bernie's in the presidential suite right now. Uh, that was a majority vote. Uh, that's a problem. I didn't, I'm sorry, Richard, can you repeat that? I didn't hear that. We're looking at a weekend at Bernie's in the White House. That's a majority vote. That's scary. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, you really only need a plurality, right? You don't even need an actual technical majority. It's, no, it's there's that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit, bit, bit scared of that because uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that people are distrustful of uh, government and and its mouthpiece, the, the, the media that basically is controlling the world. Um, but I'm a little concerned with people not trusting themselves. In essence, when they say voters, they're, they're saying, I don't trust myself. To make good no, they're saying they don't trust other voters, but yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but they're not logical enough to realize they're saying they don't trust themselves. So it's a, it's a, that's the, the slippery slope to where we need somebody else to make those decisions for, for us, or I need to have somebody else make those decisions. So there's bad people who can't be trusted to vote properly don't make them. And that um, that worries me. Well, there's two, there's two directions you can go in that situation. You can say, I don't trust the voters, therefore uh, I want to uh, put in an oligarch or a, a tyrant or, or a uh, uh, benevolent dictator or whatever to make the correct decisions. Of course, it's going to be somebody that I approve of. Or you can say government is waking, making way too many decisions. Uh, and the voters are making way too many decisions on behalf of other voters. Let's scale back the uh, decision-making uh, areas for government. And of course, that's the libertarian direction. Well, no, yeah. I, would, I, I absolutely agree if that was the trend in this country. But, um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that, uh, that this lack of trust in institutions leads to where you're going. I'm, I'm a little worried that the, the intermediate step will be that all of that uh, benevolent dictator. But you know, if we get to the point where, where more and more people, and I feel as if that's coming, that when I talk to people, uh, you know, even people in government, people who work for these some of these regulatory agencies, you know, students, uh, people in general, especially you know, business owners and all the rest of that. The idea that that there are, are too many rules and regulations, and that, that government has, has seized too much power, is is I think becoming more and more popular. And I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't take a dictatorship that we have to violently overthrow, because uh, that's the only way to get rid of them to, to get us to where we need to be, which is way less government, way less taxes, way less. Well, the difference between the American experiment was that we were supposed to be as individuals your individual rights were above the common good. That was the fundamental difference. And we have had a mindset has shifted now where we are supposed to subservient ourselves to the common good. And that's an actual danger. And you know, it pops up in this next question here. The geofence warrants, the, they had this secret geofence warrants around the Capitol is how they are catching some of these Capitol riot mobs. Now we've discussed here, again, anybody who actually went into that Capitol with ill intent should be prosecuted. We have, there's no question about it. But, you know, some of these tools they are using, secretive tools, is how we end up with these abusive authoritarian governments. And the fact that we accept this, when we didn't need it, we didn't really need this kind of thing. We have all the cameras and all the video, and, and quite frankly, if they'd had a half-competent response to the mob, we wouldn't have had this problem to begin with. I agree. But, I, I think my, I don't want to go off on a conspiracy rant, but uh, the, uh, yeah, I do, but I'm not going to. But that, that you know, there there were people there that could have kept the, the mob out of uh, uh, that building, and the decision was made not to put that barrier in place. And I have all sorts of theories about why, because it makes great theater when people are, of course, sitting in there. But that, 
you know, the, the fact is that most of those people are guilty of unlawful entry. Unlawful entry. Apparently, unlawful entry into a federal building is a much greater crime than unlawful entry into my home. They're not guilty of breaking and entering. The people who broke to enter are guilty of breaking and entering, uh, basically burglary if they went in and took stuff and left. But the rest of them are simply guilty of unlawful entry. And I challenge you to find uh, uh, you know, middle class people without criminal records um, doing any kind of time or having any serious uh, uh, criminal prosecution anywhere in the country over unlawful entry. It's like when the door of the warehouse is open and you see somebody in there pilfering, don't walk in there and pilfer with them. Do, you know, if they're not supposed to be there, don't follow them in, and then, and then you're 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 let off with a warning. But because it's unlawful entry into the edifice of power, this this overwhelming monopolist power, somehow this has now become a, you know a, a major crime, and that's upsetting. And I'm in no way making excuses for people stupid enough to do what they did. They are they are they are guilty of the highest order of lunacy, uh, and uh, you know there's going to be repercussions. But you know the idea that, that, that those people who milled about, wandered in, and looked around, and then left are guilty of some some heinous crime. I, I just don't agree with. But the idea that they're finding them by asking one of the technical overlords, Google, who uh, use its ability to track people's location within a couple of meters uh, anonymously and then sifting through all the people that were, were in that approximate location to find those are the, those are guilty. That's a huge slippery step and, and it's something that should be allowed. So, Richard? I have nothing to add. I agree. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, nothing to add. We'll move on. Big changes to California hair salons. They have now Eased, eased the training requirements for hairstylists. Well, apparently, you know, they were too heavy, but we still need our protections, our overall protectors from bad haircuts. I, it's yeah, just, well, I, actually, you know, I think I, I needed uh, protection as a kid. My grandfather gave me my haircut, and it was, uh, I had no sideburns. It was just zip, zip, zip with an electric razor around my head, and uh, that's the way I had, you know, well, you don't need a haircut, well, uh, so, you know, I mean, there is something to be said for professionalism and haircutting, but the market will provide that very easily. And it's I'm glad to see that uh, the governor, Governor Newsom, actually did the right thing by signing a bill that lessens regulation, but he doesn't eliminate regulation. The only reason those regulatory uh, regulations are in effect, there's only one reason, and that's to protect the oligarchy or the to protect the, uh, the uh, people who are already haircutters or cosmetologists or what have you. They don't want competition, so they uh, have enlisted or have been, did in the past enlist the government to uh, you know prevent uh, newcomers from joining the, the trade, prevent competition, that's all it's about. Absolutely, and, and when I saw that, they it went from they only need 1,600 hours of training or they only need 1,000 hours of training you know, to, to you know, cut hair and all this, that. Cosmetologists still need the, the all that huge amount of training, but hair, you know, people who are hairstylists don't. And the quotes in a in a couple of articles about it were were it's pretty much straightforward when you talk to people who represent these organizations supporting hairstylists and barbers and all those of that. But it's it's restrained trade, uh, you know. And the idea that it, it spills over it's not only haircutting. I mean, it's even worse in other areas. Pet people mind contract. You know, this is a, this is designed. The contractor state license board is, is designed to force people to hire a, a contractor to do something the contractor doesn't want to do, small jobs, or be a criminal uh, by hiring someone to do it who's not licensed. And over and over and over again, what what is it? Uh, what's the number? Something like forty percent of jobs in America now uh, require some kind of licensing. Uh, uh, to get to pass a kind of test that's basically sanctioned by the government in order to perform your job, 
whereas 30 years ago it was 6%. I mean, this is insane. Uh, and, and I will guarantee you that people who, you know, get their hair cut now don't feel uh, any safer about going into the place when they went into Bob barber shop on the corner 40 years ago. And they certainly don't feel any greater level of confidence in all of these uh, professions that are closed shops, like you know, attorneys and, and medicine and contractors and on and on. And on. It's restraint of trade, and it's keeping it's keeping uh, prices unnaturally high. The barriers uh, of entry into these trades uh, huge, and, and this is affecting which demographic the most? People of color, poor people. They're the ones that can't afford to pay for that education to, to enter into this profession. And hair braid, something that you know is popular in, in certain demographics, you can be arrested for braiding someone's hair without having gone through 1,600 hours of training for things that you know. Right, and okay. the worst part of that, John, was they didn't actually teach hair braiding in cosmetology school. So you'd have to go to the cosmetology school and, and to, to in order to braid hair, and you were the only person in this cosmetology school who knew how to braid hair because you've been doing it since you were a kid, yeah. and that's what these things that happened. And they, now they finally started teaching you know hair braiding in cosmetology school, but not because anybody wanted it, but because they had to, hmm. and not because the you know it, this whole thing is is so infuriating because they actually make it harder for poor people to get on that bottom rung of the ladder. They make that bottom rung of the ladder higher and higher and higher, and then they say, hey, look at all the poor people, we need to help them. Well, you've made it impossible for them to climb on the economic ladder, and then you're gonna sit here and say, we need help, you need to help them. Stop hurting them. You know, How about we stop hurting people this is a first, before we start talking about the people yeah, who need help. Yeah, don't, don't break people's legs and hand them a crutch and claim that you're the good guy. Yeah, we got about a minute or so, Richard, so we're gonna go to this last one. The uh, Biden administration's uh, oh, Comptroller, you have a nice saying about him. Go ahead. <laughs> Comptroller of the currency, the person who is in charge of regulating the banking system. The nominee, I'm not sure if I, I am pronouncing the first name correctly, uh, Saul or Sali uh, Omarova. She's originally from Kazakhstan, went to university in Moscow uh, on a scholarship back in the uh, waning years of the uh, USSR. Uh, in fact, she, the reason she got to the United States is because she was on an exchange program in 1988. And in 1989, the Soviet Union fell, so she ended up staying, uh, much to the uh, uh, benefit probably of the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union, and to the detriment of the United States, because now she is a, a Purdue law professor and wants to uh, end banking so that people are forced to bank with the Federal Reserve, direct accounts with the Federal Reserve as opposed to with the savings and loan with uh, the, uh, you know, whoever you want to go bank with now. Now, I'm not a fan of the banking industry, believe me. They uh, have been coddled and protected and uh, uh, have, have a whole lot of things wrong with them, but it's a step above. Uh, having only one bank, which is effectively, effectively what we'd have if everyone was forced to bank with the Fed.